Welcome to Shotgun Story, the podcast that has conversations with indie creators about music, meaning, and the point of it all, so that you may be inspired by the journeys of other artists who are doing it for themselves, and maybe gain a little more understanding as to why it matters quite so much that you keep creating. Jamie Aitchison, a professional jester, songwriter, string breaker, dreamer, husband and longtime member of musical obscurity with massive allergies to rent and finance and lead singer of the band Naming James. I met him before Shotgun Tory was even a thing and we both used to play at the Songwriters Club in Newtown. Yes. And here he is in studio with me. Hi Jamie. Hello Tor, how are you? Oh good. Great. So nice to see you. Yes, thanks for having me here. So lucky. I'm so glad you could come into the studio. Mm, mm. I want to start at the beginning. Okay. Why music? Where did it all begin for you? So it began when I was starting high school. There was an option to learn an instrument. And I don't know, I had always loved music from about the age of 10 or 11. Like when I say love music, understood music. And I could do the entire Bartman song from the Simpsons album mm-hmm. like, like a rap you know, and I, and I knew then that most certainly like music was a magic to me, you know. And then when I began guitar, when I was 14, when I started standard six or grade eight, took off from there. And I, I started, I didn't know really what I wanted to do with the guitar. And the school just offered guitar lessons and those lessons were classical lessons. So I did that for my high school career. Career. High school, <laughs> my high school time. And then during that high school time, while I was learning to play, and I knew for a fact that this was it forever. And that's when I began playing in bands. And I think I did my first live gig at David Jamison's 16th birthday party in 1998 at his mom's house on the one side of the pool. Mm. And I remember Jonathan Harris, my good friend from school, whose mom was a, an actress she gave us all these rescue pills or something that would uh, help relax us because we were very nervous. And I remember playing that gig and we were all half asleep during the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> but we still had all the girls sitting on the uh, uh, front of the, uh, by the pool watching us play. And that sold it for and, you. And that was it. <laughs> and, and from then, um, yeah, music was it for me and performing uh, in particular. Yeah. So yeah, I'd say from around about 14, around about when all those other great things start happening. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. (laughs) Yeah. And if you were to look at your career as a timeline, could you give me three to five highlights that would explain who you are to someone who does not know who you are? Okay. Three defining moments. Well, firstly, I think one of them is quite a tragic and it's quite a, a tough one. I had, when I was 23, I got septicemia in my blood. I got a staph infection on my heart and I had to go through a stenotomy to try and replace the ICD device that was put in that had gotten infected. Mm. And I mean, long story short, I fought for my life for about three months in an ICU. I wasn't really supposed to come back from that. And that was a hugely defining moment for me. I still, to this day, try and understand it. I was not the same when I came out of that hospital. Something had completely changed within me and everything seemed a lot easier. There was a much greater understanding of hardship and the world and that. And that really was a pivotal moment in my adult life. So that happened just after high school. So that was very defining, taught me a great resilience, a great respect for life and a love of life. And I made a deal with myself that I would never compromise doing what I wanted to do because of my health. Yeah. I always lived exactly as I wanted to and did not become a victim of what I was told by every doctor or everything. And uh, funny enough, to this day, I do not have that problem anymore. Funnily enough, I, I like to believe that I changed that with my mind. I don't have those medical problems anymore. And not because of any medicine that I had, it's because I of the way that I lived. And I, I honestly like to think I willed that out of wow. my life. It's amazing. So that, that is a hugely defining moment for me. People often ask me, why are you so happy? And because I really am, I really am happy to be here. 
and to be here with people, you know. Yeah. And very lucky that I found myself in music where I just have people on tap all the time. Well, have in the past, not so much now. Yeah. That one, I would say, is my one major thing. Yeah. The second thing, what I mentioned before about learning music, the man that I learned music from, his name was Strahinia Shine, and he came from Belgrade in the Yugoslavian Civil War in the 90s. And I started learning from him. And he couldn't really speak English even. So he taught me music, and he would have these books that he would read, and I would write down the English words like, and what they meant and stuff. So mm. we were both sort of teaching each other. And he taught me all through high school and after high school when I did my classical grades and stuff like that. And I actually went to go and work at his school for about, I think it was five to six years or so. And Mr. Shine is a huge influence in my life. And that moment when I started with him is absolutely essential in my musical and in my life, really. We talked about things in his classroom that were not music at all. Yeah. In fact, most of the time we would just chat, you know, and he taught me so much while I was a, a young adult at that time. That moment to learn music with him was a very special thing. And I'd say the third one, on a personal level, I think the day I got married to my wife, Jackie, who is like my absolute best pal, and I've known her for over 10 years. I think when we tied the knot and finally did that, that was huge for me. That was like a real, uh, one of my only real world achievements that I really, you know, went yeah. for. Those three things I'd say right now were hugely inspiring to me and cover the three kind of strong parts of my personality. Absolutely. In love and in zest for life and music, you know. And now if we were to look at your musical career, the shows that would tell your story, okay. your musical story. Absolutely. So a lot of the shows you would think maybe Opi Copy, the James Phillips stage in 2013, you know, those were thrills and uh, real milestones in my career. But I can honestly say some of the gigs that have meant the most to me have been much smaller and gigs that were not really even gigs. I performed one of my own original songs at funerals before. There's the showbiz entertainment side of it. And I, I really have experienced some wonderful high points in that. But to me, the ones that mean a lot to me, where music was used beyond music, yeah. where it was used as something. I remember when my wife's grandfather was, he was slowly dying in hospital. I would take my guitar into the hospital and play there. That to me means something more than, you know, Saturday night at a bar playing, you know, um, which I do love. But I think what keeps me going is the conscious side of it and the message in my music and where it has been used, you know, and, and not just for an entertaining purpose. I love that. Yeah. I love that. And it, it leads me into this next section, which is your ultimate why. What drives you to create? What inspires you? My creativity, my main drive is to absolutely connect with as many humans as I possibly can. Through music, that has obviously been the greatest joy of mine is to meet people and feel that connection too. Not only speaking, but I can feel it from the stage or it's in that zone, you know? And it's that communion, that fellowship with people that I really seek. And a lot of my music that I write is all about that. It's about us. And I really do believe that my role as a musician and communicator is to just remind people that who they are and what we are, and perhaps put things into perspective in that, and it's really not so bad. And this is just a ride, this whole thing that we're on. So for me, there is a huge conscious side to my music that is not just, I'm trying to have a number one single, it's, it's as long, long gone past there. Yeah. It is my offering to the world, my creativity, and just my reverence for humans, which I absolutely love. I, I can always, even the idiots, I, <laughs> I still love them. I have so many arguments with my friends and that they're like, Jamie, why? I just, I just have this capacity for, for human beings yeah. and I love them. And I think the best way that I can connect with them is singing to them in a nice way <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes in a rather crazy way. <laughs> oh, I love that. Yeah. And you're a great writer, both of songs and of prose. Can we talk about your songwriting process? Yes, absolutely. Well, so... I love the word to me. I love it. I love it's like it's a play thing for me. So I find songs are like puzzles and that. And I absolutely the process will always come with either one word or one phrase 
or the idea, but it must have the word. And the word must be like a like a lovely word, like a chameleon or something like that. You know, an, an, um, a nice sounding word. And it always happens from there. And then I'll go into the entire archive of one second little tiny riffs that I have in the, in the guitar brain. And then slowly match the tone of what I'm trying to say or what this idea is. And then I just let it go. But it always begins with a quick phrase or one word or, and it always starts from the word. And then I'll put the music to that because that's your arrow. Your idea and your message is in your word. And then it's basically just making the cake around that, you know. I sometimes am like, God, we have to get to three minutes in this song, you know, <laughs> because you get such a banger of, of something really meaningful. But then I love the the task of trying to, do you put this in there or, you know, and it becomes this kind of mold that you start building. And then all of a sudden your little song babies are walking around and then you perform them and then they take on a life of their own once you've even written them, yeah. you know. So the process starts flash of an idea, usually with the word. It always begins with the word. Wonderful. That makes me think of the word was made flesh. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly that. Mm. Collaborations. Yeah. I've seen you on stage with plenty of people. Yes. So I know that you're good at a jam. Yeah. And you are able to make something of nothing. Yes. But in terms of both songwriting and in performing, mm -hmm. let's talk about collaborations for a second. What are the best ones that you've been a part of? The best ones that I've been a part of, I perform mostly solo, mostly if, uh, over the past few years. But there was a time when I played with a band from about, I think we toured, it was our busiest time as a band between 2013 and 2015, I think it was. And Three, four years we toured and played as a proper working band. And that collaboration to me was one of the most special that I've ever had because once again, it had gone beyond music. Mm -hmm. And the two people that I played with, Ivan Oberholster and Leighton Powell, are two people that I would never forget. And I'm sure they'll never forget me either <laughs> because my goodness, we did some crazy things. But that collaboration to me was incredibly special because it was a three-way, we all contributed creatively. It was a team, it was a gang, you know, and it was, uh, that was really our lives. We were basically married to each other for a while. And to this day, I have a massive amount of respect for those two humans who never really complained. And we did like some grueling stuff and not really for, any, for anything at the end, you know. I still joke to this day, Ivan is now happily married, living in LA, and you know he met his wife on tour. Leighton's uh, baby girl was conceived on tour. You know we had a real, aside from the stage, that was a collaboration of epic proportion across the board. You know, mm. but musically, I remember winning a competition on Five FM. It was a, a competition. If they picked your song, I would play it with the parlor tones opening for live on their black mountain tour in 2006 and wow. i won the, the competition so i went and i met the guys from the parlor tones and we played and practiced that and they were like this is a cool song you know and they all learned the parts of the song and then i performed that one song at the dome to like you know i still have a little video of it somewhere on a computer somewhere but that experience blew my mind it was three minutes of, I mean, I, I've never played a bigger gig since, you know, and I, I, that was like a, just an absolute thrill and rush to have a full band behind you playing to the dome. And I was sort of just in my early 20s then trying to, you know, make, get it going. And I mean, that really, that really was a mind blower for me, you know. Wow. Wow. And what do you think it takes to make a good collaborator? In a music collaboration, I've played with a lot of people who don't listen to other people playing. And the more that you play together, what's the word I'm looking for? Just some consideration, a bit of listening. Mm. I think the best way to play with other people is to listen to them. I've played with many who don't, I don't think even listening to themselves. <laughs> <laughs> but my best collaborations are the ones where we can listen to each other. And especially mm. in a musical sense, in an instrument sense, it's kind of different if you're collaborating with ideas and words. But in a musical sense, you must sympathetic. Sympathy is exactly how it should be on the stage, especially when there's lots of you. Yeah. In that respect, I collaborated hugely with some friends of mine from Some Grow Young, which was a great experience. 
Jay Bones, who I did a whole album with, mm. was a one, and I know you have as well. What an amazing experience that was. I think Jay is a hugely creative mind, and that time spent putting that album together, spending nights at uh, Jay's house and that, I really, really love that. I will definitely actually do that again. Yeah. So my collaboration with Jay was was definitely one of my – and, he, you know, for years he was like I really looked up to him. I still yeah. do. For the first few times I had to kind of pinch myself and sort of go, like, God, we, I'm like duking out these songs with Jay, you know. Yeah. And eventually he had to even say, like, Jamie, you can say, like, no, that's a bad idea. <laughs> you know what I mean? So – that kind of put me into that's when I started realizing you know a lot of work had been done and a lot of people that I really looked up to at the beginning are now my peers and we know each other and we know each other's families and that and so that collaboration to me was was really amazing because I think doing an album is a massively grueling and very very mentally taxing thing even when you're not recording it it is constantly on your brain and there's something about putting a record of something down that is highly stressful. So I think with that one, that, that collaboration to me was, was absolutely amazing. And I mean, on the stage, I've collaborated with so many. I mean, you and I have played together thousands of times. One of my best ones was when you and Andra and myself did a wonderful performance at Millie Pop. We did one oh. of, uh, uh, which song did we do? We did one of yours. It was... Um, the road it was something about the road oh it was the, the love of folk the love for the love of folk that was it that was a huge highlight for me i have played with jakes from tidal waves just him and i together we played a few bob marley songs i think that was a huge thing for me when i taught at the music school i would sometimes jam with my students yeah great that was an amazing thing yeah. i love playing with people when they're learning and stuff like that so yeah i think it's any collaboration is wonderful always better with someone else always better totally it's nice to be able to have in your arsenal the ability to teach. And yes. Having you mention that there. Yeah. I mean, after this crazy year that we've had, what do you think some of the challenges that musicians today are facing, the ones that make them change careers? Well, I think it's the classic one. That first roadblock you're going to hit is uh, how, do I, how do I exist in the real world? Mm. You have to put petrol in your car, pay your rent, buy food, you know, that kind of stuff. So I think a lot of artists, in, not only musicians, I think performers of all kinds, they've had obviously their hands cut off in this last year, uh, so to speak. The ones that have looked for something else outright are perhaps maybe early in the journey or have not had to sort of go through those milestones before. I, for one, have been through tough, tougher times than last year with when I've even been playing a lot, you mm. know. So... I'm quite lucky that I have been doing this a long time and I'm quite prepared for that. I think you just got to get really clever and creative even more so, mm-hmm. you know. But it, it, it does sadden me how perhaps some younger people would give up or perhaps pursue something different where if they just had a little bit more resilience and belief in their creativity that can actually breach through any hardship that you ever have, mm. I honestly think you can go through that. Creatively, even more so than following the rules. It's actually creative people, when the times are tough, that have come up with new ideas to do things. Mm. So um, I think the people that are taking it in their stride and creating new paths or widening the path, that's where the new journey is going to be. And I, I really hope that people don't get too afraid, especially people with dreams, creative dreams, performing dreams of that. I really hope those don't get shot out of the sky just because of a simple thing like getting some money, you know. You can get some money. You can make some money some way, somehow. And if you really want to, you can. We used to have this saying on tour. My brother always used to say it. If you're on your 16th hour driving back from a festival and you're nearly at Joburg or whatever, or a tour or whatever, and when someone would complain, we'd just go, well, how bad do you want it? (laughs) And uh, usually we'd shut up after that, you know, because there is an end goal in mind. And you know what? If you get through it, that hardship and that journey of it is part of it yeah you know? absolutely yeah. yeah i'm so glad to hear you say that mm. what are some of the creative ways that you've noticed people well aside from selling weed um, <laughs> <laughs> i have seen well obviously the stream thing is the first port of call yeah. but other things i started or i got an idea from a friend of mine who took old guitars and started painting them as sort of art pieces there is nothing to say that we can't sit at home and write 
and still be creative and create, mm. I think now's a great time to record music. Yeah. We can record music on our cell phones now. So, you know, while we can't be out there, let's be inside and create. Yeah. The flow must never stop, you know. Yeah. And it's not always in a straight line. It's going to diverge and it's, sometimes it'll just trickle down and then join another river, you know. But that flow never stops. Buddies of mine that uh, are doing stuff on the side, deliveries and things like that, not so creative in that, but those are the ones that are just doing stuff to keep going and being able to keep creating yeah. and not sort of packing the guitar away or closing the piano or closing the book or whatever. I think that to me is not an option. Yeah. And I think anyone that is a true artist, that is your test. Mm. And I think other people that do not maybe have that credit will look to that. I think that is what is going to start changing now yeah. is the creative energy is going to be the one that takes us through, not the latest finance deal or whatever the, I can't even think of a, of a sort of reference, but I think it's a human time now. It's a human time and it's a together time. I think the artist is going to save the day. Oh. <laughs> you are speaking my language. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Some light questions. Oh, yay. Mm -hmm. Is there a song in existence? Yes. That you wish that you had written? There are so many songs that I wish I'd written. Mm. But if I had to pick one, yeah. there is a song by my most favorite of a writer of all time, music writer, Tom Waits. And he has a song called Dirt in the Ground. Mm. And it's just, just a song about our own mortality. And the lyrics on that... It's basically like the entire Bible in a song. It's your whole life in one song. And it just puts it so plainly. There's a line in there that said, hell is boiling over and heaven is full. We're chained to this world and we all got to pull. <sighs> and that line in itself is a prophetic song to me. And uh, I wish he'd recorded it better and sang it better because to listen <laughs> to it is horrendous. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really gruff delivery and it's... I couldn't even get the words on the first delivery or whatever. Yeah. But that to me in a songwriting capacity is, I think, to me, one that just really stands out. I'd, I'd love wish to I'd hear written you cover that. that. And also, Riku Lati's I Want You Dead. I wish I'd written that one. There's a line in there that says something about using your nipples as coasters. <laughs> I mean, that is the greatest thing ever. I'm totally going to go listen to that song. Have you never heard it? No, no, never. So he wrote this song that was supposed to scare children yeah. but it absolutely does not because it's the most fun song ever the lyrics are all about just someone who wants somebody dead but it's very tongue-in-cheek i think the lyrics are like uh, i want to see your face on missing posters i want to use your nipples as my coasters <laughs> and the whole song is so hilarious but so dark it's oh, so uh, nice so I, I really love that one that just popped into my brain now oh but songs i mean i could have a different song every week mm. They're flying around my brain all the time. You should cover that Tom Waits one. I'd like to hear your version. I actually do have a cover of it. Yeah. It's on YouTube. I did I it listen. many years ago. When I sound like a little boy. <laughs> <laughs> I did it at a Night with a Songwriter that Josie did at the Pop Art Theatre many years ago. Yeah. I must actually double check that performance and see if it's still worthy of being on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just remember that now. A wishless collaboration? Wow. If it was just anybody in the whole world? Uh, yes, that's what I mean. Wow. You know, I would have to just say Bob Dylan before he dies. Yeah. That would be it. To me, uh, that's the master, you know, the absolute master. I found out the other day or end of last year, he sold his entire songwriting catalog. He still gets all his royalties yeah. from the covers and that, but I could not believe that. And I was going through how big the catalog it is, is enormous. I would just love to even be there in shiny shoe or something. Oh. I mean, uh, just to be in the room for five minutes, that would be me done. Just to be in that energy of that body of work, I, it seems like an alien to me that one human being could have put that work out. I know, and you know, so in a lifetime. much. Like so much and so brilliant. Yeah, um, so brilliant. That would be an absolute dream to me. Mm. Absolute dream. Oh, I like that. He's got a great podcast, actually, that Whiskey Tales. I did not know He's that. hilarious, too. Um, it's called, I don't know, it's called, uh, just look for the Bob Dylan. I'm going to. Of course, it's really great. He's so funny, man. He's quite funny with his words. Oh, <laughs> that's so exciting. Actually, I'm always looking for good podcasts. Yeah, he's great. Okay, as we wind down towards the end, mm -hmm. what advice 
would you have for indie artists yeah. to make them keep going? Obviously, you should never stop. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And the best way to do that is to try and find where your creative output is. You should never, ever compare, especially in the arts, like you can compare yourself with the entire world. And that is already setting yourself up for disaster. Us creative artists and that are so fragile and we need to keep our inner children very happy. I just think resilience and absolute belief in yourself. And you have to be prepared to just eat shovel loads of shit. (laughs) You are just, you just have to do that. You have to be prepared for that and your belief in your dream and your vision will get you through, but that vision must be true to yourself. And it takes time to find that. You may think that you are one thing and always be open. Don't think that you are that and then that is where you're gonna go because it will change and evolve all the time. But there is a thread that is your artistic inner child. That is yours. No one else has that. You need to find that and make sure that that inner child is happy all the time and be honest with that little child inside you because that is your creativity and you must nurture that. So if you have to do deliveries on the side and if you have to go and play covers in the corner of the keg and dishcloth in flippin', go and do it yeah. because that is what's going to reveal yourself to yourself way down the line and it will always reveal yourself to yourself and it will always be there as a reference. So my advice is just be resilient and be kind to your inner child because that's your creativity and that will take you everywhere that you want to go. Oh, I love that. <laughs> and if now anybody wants to follow your journey or see what's up next for you, what are your social media links? All the normal ones. Well, let me not say all the normal ones. Facebook, Instagram, I use the most and YouTube and there's a YouTube channel and namingjames.com. And that is it. And if you look outside your window, maybe I'll be there. (laughs) That's super creepy. Mowing your lawn. (laughs) Okay, that's less creepy. Yeah, yeah. So I had to put the lawnmower thing in there to be less creepy. (laughs) Thank you for this. An absolute pleasure, Tor. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure talking to you. Yeah, I can't wait to see you play again. I can't wait to see you play either. (laughs) Maybe we should play together. Yeah, we should. Okay, good. Okay, bye. Okay, bye. If you are an indie artist whose passion for what you do can inspire or fuel others, get in touch. I'd love to chat. You can find me on Instagram at Shotgun Tori. You've been listening to another production from Solid Gold Podcasts.
they never add up, amount to anything. We just feed each other poetry and lies. So all I can do is keep on singing to you and imagine we're real and that we don't have a clue. As I start to play, I close my heavy eyes. Songs about money, call it what you like. Songs about what you wanna do with your life. Songs about to cut me 'cause it cuts you right. Songs about as sharpened as the butcher's knife. Songs about as sharpened as the butcher's.